Agent for the Social Work Resources Committee of 28th of June 2023. Uh, we have apologies from Councillor Alex Allison and Councillor uh, Lockhart is substituting. Apologies from Councillor Bradley. Um, um, we have present Councillor Walter Brogan, Robert Brown, Arch Buchanan, Matthew Buchanan, Janine Callikes, Maureen Devlin, Mary Donnelly. We have apologies from Councillor Fagan. Um, we have present Councillor Faulkner, Councillor Frame, Councillor Handybode, Councillor Horn, Councillor Horsham, Councillor Hose, Councillor Johnson Dempsey. We have apologies from Councillor Logan, and we have Councillor Cowie substituting. And um, we have apologies from Councillor McDonald, and we have Councillor Anderson substituting. We have present Councillor McClyman, apologies from Councillor Nelson. And um, we have present Councillor Nugent, apologies from Councillor Ross. We have present Councillor Scott, Councillor Walker, and Councillor Watson. I'll hand back to the chair. Thanks. Thanks, Tracy. Um, moving on then to item one, any declarations of interest? No, thank you. Um, item two is minutes of the previous meeting. Um, can these be approved as a correct record? Agreed. Thank you. Um, moving on now to monitoring items. Item three is the revenue budget monitoring 2022 to 23 for the period 1st of April 2022 to the 31st of March 2023 pages 11 to 20, and could I invite Graham Booth to speak to the report, please? Thank you, Chair. The purpose of the report um, is to provide information on the actual expenditure against budget for social work resources for financial year 22-23 uh, for the period 1st of April 2022 to 31st of March 2023. This is the fifth revenue monitoring report to committee for financial year 2022-23. Sections 5.1 to 5.4 on pages 11 and 12 outline the year-end position and the resource is reporting an unplanned underspend position against the budget of 5.6 million before transfers to reserves and a break-even position after proposed transfers to reserves. This is before taking account the impact of job evaluation, which is covered further at sections 5.5 to 5.11. The transfer to reserves has arisen from an unplanned underspend within adult and older people's services, and there are also unplanned underspends within performance support services and justice services, which are offsetting an overspend in children and family services. The budget delegated to the IGIB has underspent by 7.5 million and the council agreed to the IGIB retaining 1.4 million of this within the reserves at probable outturn. This has increased to 1.9 million as at the 31st of March and is earmarked for future care costs in line um, with the approach to integrating health and social care budgets. It was also agreed at probable outturn that 5.6 million would be transferred to a council reserve to be used in 23-24 to support children and family pressures. Appendices A to E on pages 15 to 19 provide details on the year-end position and detailed variance explanations and proposed variants for each service are also shown in Appendices B to E. Sections 5.5 to 5.11 on pages 12 and 13 outline the position in relation to home carers' job evaluation and backdated pay. The outcome of the job evaluation exercise for home carers will result in significant recurring costs and work is ongoing to aim to agree a recovery plan to balance the forecast and overspending budget in 2023-24 and determine actions required to be taken to deliver the recovery plan. In relation to the backdated pay, the outcome of the review is now known and a basis has been established for backdating to October 2020. The value of the back pay will, will take some time to calculate, however these costs will be included within the financial position for 2022-23. The Executive Committee had previously agreed that 5.6 million of the underspend would be transferred to a council reserve to be used in 23-24 to support the children and families' pressures. However, as the home care back pay is now required to be paid, the IG IGIB will no longer underspend and the funding will not be available. The Council has identified other funding to help with the costs in 23-24 and a proposal was made to the Executive Committee on this. As of the outcome of the review was only known as this report was, was being finalised, it has not been possible to update the figures in the report to reflect the outcome highlighted. We will require to quantify the full costs and a funding package will be brought back to August um, to Executive Committee. I refer members back to Section 2 of the report. 
committee is asked to note the final break-even position to 31st of March 2023 and to approve the proposed budget violence. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, I don't see any questions. Sorry, uh, John Anderson. Thanks, Chair. It's just in this report, there's, the variance is quite high in some of the individual lines. And I'm just wondering what adjustments have been made going forward for this year's budget? Because I already noticed that this year's budget, although it's, it's the first report, some of the lines, again, are quite high. So did we make any changes knowing the fact that we never kept within last year's budget? Have we made changes to this year's budget to reflect that? Thanks. In, in terms of the budget being carried forward to this year, as I say, it is a, a rolling forward budget, but we do make realignments um, throughout the year. In terms of the some of the variances that we're starting to see in the in the New Year's budget, as I say, they are um, as I say, the children and families is, is ongoing, and, and that's why we have um, outlined within that that there'll be funding um, from the centre to to fund those pressures um, going forward. Um, within, as I say, the the specific services, we will still see. Um, over and under spend across specific lines, but again, they will be they will be monitored and realignments as required as we go through the year. But in terms of the bigger ones, yes, we are obviously trying to make a plan for them just based on the, the position that we had at the end of the financial year, taking that forward into the, the new year. Chair, if I might, would it not have been better making these adjustments at the start? Because we know they're going to be over or under at the start rather than just rolling over the same budget when we know we're not going to actually be anywhere near some of these lines. But it would have been better saying at the start, right, we'll adjust the budget to suit what's actually the reality of what's happening. I think again, it's just it's just due to the timing, as I say, of it being a rollover budget and having to identify where the funding's coming from. So I appreciate, as I say, at the start of the year, we don't. Um, it's just having the full plan available of of all the specific places where the funding's coming from, and then, as I say, realigning as required. Which is why, as I say, within the the new year report, we've identified the the specific funding now which is going to contribute towards the pressures, and we will then realign thereafter. But as I say, it's identifying where it's where it's coming from and getting the approval that the the funding can be used as required um, to allow us to do that. We don't have approval, as I say, at that point, just to, to realign. So, as I say, we do bring that forward as proposals. Okay, um, thanks, Graham, and thanks for the question. I don't see any more questions. Um, does the meeting agree to the recommendations in Section 2 in the report? Agreed. Thank you. Um, moving on to Item 4, uh, Revenue Budget Monitoring 2023 to 24 for the period 1st of April to 19th of May 2023, and it's pages 21 to 28. And could I ask Graeme again to speak to this? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of this report, which is on pages 21 to 29, is to provide information on the actual expenditure um, for the period 1st of April 2023 to 19th of May 2023, which is our financial period two, and to provide the forecast for the year to 31st of March 2024. This is the first revenue monitoring report to committee for financial year 23-24. Sections 5.1 to 5.5 .5 outline the financial position to the 19th of May with the resource report in a break-even position. And within children and family services, budget pressures are ongoing in 23-24 in relation to residential placements, fostering and kinship care, some of which is a legacy from the pandemic. 5.6 million was planned to be available this financial year following the approval at probable outturn of the adult and older people under unplanned underspend from last financial year. However, as detailed in the previous um, period 14 report to this committee, the outcome of home carers job evaluation changes this funding source um, and an alternative funding source has now been put, um, proposed to the executive committee. In addition, a further 3.6 million is available from a balance of central funding um, to contribute towards the residual pressures we've experienced in 23-24. Um, in, in and the period to overspend position on children and families assumed that funding being available and is currently being managed by an underspend on our performance and support services. Appendices A to E on pages 26 to 29 provide details on the period to um, position and again the detailed variance explanations and proposed environments for each of the services are shown in appendices B to E. 
Sections 5.6 to 5.12 on pages 22 and 23 again outline the position in relation to home carers' job evaluation and back pay in line with the previous report. I refer members back to section 2 of the report. Committee is asked to note the break-even position as at 19th of May 2023, note the forecast break-even position to 31st of March 2023 and to approve the proposed budget environments. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Uh, I've got Councillor Brown. Yes, thanks, thanks very much, Chair. Um, it's really a follow-on to Councillor Anderson's comment because um, behind all this, there lies obviously a big issue with regard to staffing recruitment. And I just wonder when the budget is set, and I probably should, should know this, what, what sort of arrangements are made for that? I mean, is it the complement that it's budgeted for, you know, the approved complement? Is it the sort of reality of last year's staffing? Or is there some in-between figure? What, what exactly is set in terms of the budgeted figure for, if you like, provision of staff? There is a budget for an approved budgeted establishment, so that will include vacancies, you know, et cetera. So it's it, it's not a case of the position as it was at last year. If there's approval to have an X, X number of posts within uh, within a service, as I say, that the budget is there for that. So that's why you will see underspends coming through at the start of the year, because there will be a continuation from last year, obviously, of those um, posts being vacant, but the budget is still for there for them. And as I say, we have to keep providing for the budget for a level of um, posts that um, the, the services are able to recruit to. So again, the, the start of the year, as I say, we'll, just, we'll, we'll, we'll see the continuation of the final position from last year. But as those um, posts, as I say, are start, or there's turnover in those posts and posts start to be recruited, that's when you would then see a, a difference in the variances as staff come into posts and costs are against those budgets. Yeah, just as a comment on that, Chair, I mean, in effect, when you've got staffing vacancy levels of 25% or whatever, as it's talked about in the future report, and there's going to be a considerable um, unrealism, isn't there, about the actual budget thing in this kind of situation. Um, and we're going to end up with quite a significant underspend in a number of different areas, which is ongoing. Does that get adjusted during the year? How do you deal with that? In terms of staff and budgets, again, yes, we will monitor the turnover, um, as I say, or the, the level of vacancies within, and that can be arranged with the service, as I say, to, to realign as required as we get through the year. But in terms of the, there still has to be an understanding that the, the, there is budget there if a, if a service is looking to, to fill their full complement of staff. But, yeah, no, the, we can realign from employee costs. But, again, we would likely do that through um, creating a level of turnover within the service and realigning the budget to, um, to another budget area would be the way we would do that. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Graham. I don't see any further questions. Um, does the meeting agree to the recommendations in section two of the report? Agreed. Thank you. Um, moving on, item five, uh, capital budget monitoring 2022 to 23 for the period 1st of April 2022 to 31st of March 2023. And it's pages 29 to 32. And can I invite Lorraine O'Hagan to speak to the report, please? Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, item five, then, is the first of two uh, reports for social work resources covering the capital programme. So on page 29 is the first report, which is the old year report for financial year 22-23. And the purpose of the report is to advise committee of the spend for the full financial year 22-23. And the information included in this report was included in the report that went to executive committee last week. So section three of your report gives you the background and explains the budget position for the year. So the budget reported to the last Social Work Committee in May was 3.903 million, and we have had no changes um, to that budget since that last meeting. So Section 5 then goes on to provide the detailed financial implications. Section 5.1 notes the total programme for the year was the 3.903 million, with a final spend position for the year of 4.210 million. So we had an additional spend of £307,000 on the approved programme for that year. Section 5.2 goes on to explain the overspend is due to the timing of spend on the community alarms and Swiss Plus replacement projects, which are multi-year programmes. And funding for the overall spend on these projects has already been identified in the 23-24 programme. So section 5.3 goes on to explain that these funds will be used to meet the spend into last year um, and we'll bring um, a new programme for financial year 23-24 in the next report that I'll talk you through in a few seconds. Um, so in terms of the, this report, if I can take committee back to the recommendations in section 2 and ask that the social work resources programme of 3.903 million and expenditure for the full financial year of 4.210 million be noted. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lorraine. I don't see any questions. Um, does the meeting approve the recommendations in section two of the report? Great. Thank you. Um, moving on to item six, capital budget monitoring 2023-24 for the period 1st of April to 19th of May 2023. And that's pages 33 to 36. And can I invite Lorraine again to speak to the report? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so item six then on page 33 is the new year report and it's the standard capital budget report for the new financial year 23-24 and um, similar to revenue it reflects the budget and spend position to the 19th of May which is our accounting period two. Section three gives you the background and explains how the budget is based on the overall capital programme for the year which was presented to the executive committee um, last week. Section 5 details the financial implications in a bit more detail. Um, so section 5.1 notes the total programme for the year is 2.030 million. The budget's based on the original programme of projects that we had approved back in February of this financial year and we've updated it to reflect the impact of our full spend from last financial year. So we've done a bit of team laden across the two years just because of the profile of spend. Um, the budget also reflects the estimated level of spend achievable for the financial year for these projects based on current estimates. Section 5.2 then goes on to note the anticipated spend at the end of period two was 323,000 and we've spent 323,000 pounds at that point. So I'll be looking to refer committee back to the recommendation then in section two and note that the social work resources budget of 2.03 million and spend to the 19th of May of 323,000 be noted. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. I don't see any questions. Does the meeting agree to approve the recommendations in the report? Agreed. Thank you, and thank you, Lorraine, for the reports. Um, moving on to item seven, workforce monitoring, March and April 2023, pages 37 to 44. And could I invite Eileen McPate to speak to the report? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, this is the Social Work Resources Workforce Monitoring Report covering the period March, April 2023. So section 4.1 outlines attendance statistics for committee and the details are in appendix one. The absence rate for the resource for April is 7.4% and that's compared to a council-wide figure of 5.1%. This is decreased by 0.8% compared to the previous month and compared to the same period last year, the figure has decreased by 0.9%. The projected annual average for the resource is 7.4% compared to a council-wide figure of 5.1%. Moving on then, sections 4.2 to 4.5 and the details are in Appendix 2. And the main points are that during the period, there was 246 occupational health referrals. There was two disciplinary hearings. There was no grievances or dignity at work issues raised. There was 34 accidents or incidents during the period. And there was 21 leavers and of them 33% completed exit interviews. Details of posts that became vacant during the period are in Appendix 2, and there was 49 posts that became vacant, and in terms of um, how they would be filled, managers indicated that 43 of the posts would be filled. Uh, there would be three held pending a review of the service. There was one that was uh, ended due to a fixed-term contract, and two will be filled on a fixed-term basis. And then I'm asking to refer back to the committee back to section 2.0 in terms of the recommendations and ask that the workforce monitoring information for social work resources covering the period March to April 2023 be noted. Thanks, Eileen. Um, I have a few questions. Um, Councillor Frame. Thanks very much, Chair. I've got three questions. Do you want me to ask them all together? So the first one is in your, um, the absent figure is still at a high percentage and projected annual for the resource for 2023-24 is 7.4%. This is compared to a council-wide average of 5%. Considering this is a resource that's under extreme stress, can ask what's been doing to alleviate these pressures. And the next one is on your accident incident. There was 34 accidents and incidents. This is an increase of 12 but there's no information on that. Can we have some more information on that, please? Um, my last question is regarding an email I got um, yesterday from Ian Beatty. So I'd asked in February's um, Social Work Committee for an update on a survey that has been sent out to clients, families and carers on the new 
um, service or a new model that was for allocating their work for the day. So I've still not had that survey back and Ian got back and said that the survey has not been carried out because they were focusing on the the carers. Can I ask why the survey wasn't then just sent out to the clients and the families considering it as the clients that saying they're still not getting a continuity of care? So I'm just looking for an update of that, thanks. I'm happy to come in uh, in terms of the first two points and then I'll refer to Ian for the for the final point. In terms of the absence figure, although the figure for April is reported as 7.4%, not what we know is in May that we've seen that decreasing. There's been an increased focus in terms of maximising attendance, ensuring the policy is um, being applied and uh, that managers are carrying out appropriate actions to make sure that people are supported in terms of a return to work. Uh, and we are actually seeing that, uh, as I say, that are coming down and that continues to be uh, an increased focus in terms of the officers within EHR and indeed the managers within the service. In terms of the accidents and incidents, I can uh, provide a further background, but what I do know is uh, that there has been a, a, an increase if you compare it to the uh, the period uh, last year. Um, but what we do know is um, that um, of the increase of 12, six of them were relating to one particular service user and there was just a, 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 a run of incidents um, uh, relating to a service user in, in a particular unit. Uh, so that accounts for some of the uh, the increase. We will see a variance, obviously, from, from time to time. And uh, as these um, accidents and incidents are reported, then uh, they continue to be uh, investigated and any uh, appropriate actions uh, are, are monitored going forward. Uh, I'll defer to Ian for the third point. So, so the, the survey we had intended to send out um, earlier on in the year just to kind of test out the the, the feedback around the, the implementation of, of the, the new scheduling system. I suppose a couple of things were, were, were then in place. So one uh, you already referred to, Councillor, was the uh, work around the um, carer's job evaluation, which uh, was taking a lot of focus at the time. So there was a, you know, the resource was really directed towards that primarily. The, the second element was that we had already you know, picked up. There were some um, implementation issues, some system issues that we were, we're already working on. So we've done um, things like additional training. We've done some work with the provider around uh, configuration and uh, resilience on, on, on the system. So in a way, we already kind of knew some of the answers to the questions that, you know, there was work still to be done to, to make, make the, the system run optimally. So we were working on that behind the scenes and have made some progress with that. Um, I mean, for example, we, we just issued some, some new guidance, some additional training to to the to the schedulers um, um, who, are, who are operating the the, the the system, so I suppose it's trying to work out the the, the best time to, to to receive the feedback, so we don't just get the answer we know already. So I think what would be useful is to then retest the system, so we'll embed in the, the, the changes we've made, and then go back out to staff and the families just to make sure that we've, we've got it right. You know, are there any further further tweaks we need to make the, to the system to make it work to, to the optimum level? Okay, Kat, you want back in, Councillor? Just on the accident incidents, if they're saying six of them came for the same service user, can I ask why it wasn't documented in the papers then? So the documentation should have been more information on this, on the papers, to like, all it says is compared to the same period. So we need to know more information on that. And yes, I would be grateful if we could have more details on that. And also... With the, we, we were saying, Ian, I do, I totally understand that, but I asked this question in February. So can I ask why we didn't get any feedback? If you had found out there was a couple of issues and there were a couple of issues that you were then going to resolve, we had asked back in February for communication to all councillors and it took to yesterday to get that communication. I think there has to be, there's been a communication breakdown there because we deserve to know what's been going on. We're looking after our constituents as well. Thank you. In terms of the information on accidents and incidents that's included within the report, um, it's a standard report, so there's standard wording um, that, that, that's agreed and that's what's used for all the workforce monitoring reports. Um, as again, the, the further detail that's provided generally will have the information to hand so that we can we can provide that. So I can provide that separately, but it, it's not generally reflected that level of detail and obviously depending on what the accident and incident is, it can't really be shared in, in, in this type of document. 
Okay, so um, I accept the point you're making that you know that this has been a, an issue that's been um, in the air for for a, for a few months now. But I suppose I was trying to to explain it's been quite a dynamic you know circumstance that you know there's been quite a lot of change in the, in the environment we're working within. So we've been holding back from giving you a definitive answer because there was there was always something else kind of happening. So we're concerned we're just giving you a bit of a story, and then we're going to be moving on to. To, to, to another, another change. So I accept the point you're making that you'd have liked the, the information a bit sooner in a, in a, in a, in a more um, uh, an earlier update. But I suppose that, that's the, that was the thinking behind this. We didn't want to kind of you know give you information and then change it a week later. So then there's been quite, you know, quite a dynamic circumstance you've been working with. Well, we, have, we, haven't, we haven't pinned down the date. You know, obviously we've, we've just you know recently you know agreed you know the, the, the job evaluation arrangements with the carers. We've only recently just you know, updated the system and updated the guidance, so we want to give that a wee bit of time time to to, to, to settle in. So I'll I'll, I'll uh, pin that down with the, with the service manager, and uh, you're looking for an update on when that's going to happen. So I'll, I'll try and get that that sorted out for you and get that out. Thanks, Ian. Um, Councillor Donnelly. Yeah, it probably is a question to Ian, um, but you can direct me otherwise. It's in regards to recruitment and retention challenges. Um, and also I'm going to specifically raise the within social care amongst other employee groups. Uh, is there an expectation that uh, this will be eased in the light of the recent successful job evaluation outcome, which will result in improved pay for social care staff. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Donnelly. Um, Ian, do you want to take that? So, so, so in essence, the, the, the job, job evaluation has only covered the, um, the, the, the care at home workforce. Um, and, and I've no doubt a, an improved um, salary offer will, will make, make that particular role more attractive. So we're advertising those posts, and I'm sure we'll, we'll continue to get a, a positive um, um, uptake of, of, of those. Um, I think the, kind of the, the wider concern is always the, the, the kind of competition across the, the social care um, workforce in, in total. So we often find that if we um, put a post out to advert that some of the applicants are coming from, from other, other providers, so our, our overarching main concern really is sustaining the, the the scale of the workforce across the whole kind of um, um, all the social care, so the council services and our, our external partners. Um, so in some ways, you know, the, um, our offer being more more attractive um, may have a, a, a converse impact on, on 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 other providers. So we do need to kind of work that one through in the longer term. Thanks, Ian. Um, Councillor Anderson. Thanks, Chair. Page 38, 4.7 says there was 49 employees left the resource. But in 4.5, it says there's only 21 leavers were eligible for an exit interview. What's the criteria for the exit interview if not everybody that's leaving, or most folk are leaving, don't qualify for an exit interview? In terms of staff that are eligible for an exit interview, um, for the purposes um, of the reporting, it's staff that leave voluntarily um, that, that, are, that are leaving. So, for example, if someone was retiring um, or uh, they were dismissed or uh, they were uh, exiting uh, due to an end of fixed time contract, for example, that's not included into they're not, they're not eligible for an exit interview. It's just the people that are leaving voluntarily. But there is a bit of a wider piece of work in terms of understanding movement of staff that, that's going on. Um, because what we do know is we get people that will move internally and not necessarily externally. Uh, and we want to get a better understanding. Um, and that all feeds into the workforce planning actions around recruitment and retention and, and to see what improvements are made in terms of uh, making sure uh, that, that we're keeping the staff that we've got. Thanks. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thanks, Chair. It, it, probably following on a bit from Councillor Frame's initial question uh, about the link. Have uh, uh, we identified or are looking at any link between the high uh, absence due to the, the stress and the workload that's getting put on our staff, particularly 
of care staff because I, I believe that uh, there, there is an issue there that our staff are areas are understaffed. The staff we have, uh, there's immense pressure getting put on them to do extra shifts, do extra hours, and, and no necessary uh, at the request of the members of staff because they, they've got other commitments, but there's a feeling that they've got to, to do things because they're providing care. Uh, and I think that is a stress point within the, the resource and there's a, a knock-on effect then of uh, having high levels of absentees because of uh, that stress that's getting put on people and I'd maybe just like a comment on that but also I don't know how many times we've come to committees and we've heard about maximising attendance policies but if you, if you look at the table in appendix one I mean it's consistent and it's been consistent for for years that social work resources are uh, higher than the, the, the council-wide average, and I get about the, the age and the et cetera, the workforce and maybe the type of job that they're doing, but I, I just don't see any improvement over the years, and I'm wondering, you, you mentioned there's ongoing work going in, in other areas, and when are we going to see some fruition of that? And Because there must be quite a substantial financial cost to the resource and the council with these high levels. Uh, so maybe just if you want to comment on some of the points, but I just, when are we going to see some improvement? I think. Thanks, Councillor Watson. Eileen, do you want to respond? Thanks. As I said earlier, there are a number of actions that, that are ongoing in relation to um, maximising attendance. Um, and you've, you also alluded yourself to the fact that kind of the, the demographics around the workforce or social work resources, and you do tend to see that um, it will be higher than the council-wide average, for example. Um, but um, there have been particular focus around um, longer-term absences. Uh, and as I say, making sure that there's um, supports either to get um, people to return to work or um, perhaps um, um, assisting them leaving the organisation, maybe through ill health retiral or through a career break or whatever. And we're trying to escalate that process, but we're sometimes at the um, the mercy of um, other factors that are in play. And it may well be that we can't get the appropriate um, reports from uh, GPs, for example, to allow those processes to to, to conclude. We're about to um, appoint a new occupational health provider and we're hoping that that gives us an opportunity to review some of our processes um, in relation to that, um, particularly around our health retiral, and that helps us move things on um, because part of that is the occupational health referral, which we know is sometimes is a bit of a is a bit of a sticking point. I think in addition to that, um, uh, employee health and wellbeing is a key action as part of our workforce plan. And there's a number of um, a number of supports that are uh, available across the whole workforce, but we do have some dedicated um, supports in terms of social care um, and also uh, the, the efforts that are made to try and uh, increase the workforce um, will reduce the requirement that maybe if people get, a, you know, your you're saying anecdotally hearing people that are getting asked to do um, additional shifts or additional workload. That is something that service managers across the board are aware of uh, and they're hoping that um, with uh, more robust procedures in place and uh, workforce arrangements then that should ease that. Um, but um, all of this doesn't happen overnight so um, we are hoping uh, to see that things will, will, will improve but I, I appreciate the point you're making. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks, Eileen. I don't have any further questions. Does the meeting agree to approve the recommendations in the report in Section 2? Agreed. Thank you. Um, moving on to Item 8, um, update of the 2022-23 Risk Register and Risk Control Plan. And that's pages 45 to 56. And could I invite Craig to speak to the report? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, folks. So the risk report uh, provided today, you will see that at item 3.5, we have reviewed the top risks that impact on social work resources and also the fact that we are contributing to the review of the Council's top risks, uh, the process currently ongoing. At 4.1, we have provided you with detail of the top five risk areas 
that we are currently uh, grappling with. These are workforce availability and capacity, meeting the public protection and legislative duties, market and provider capacity, and funding and budgetary pressures, as well as the forthcoming winter demand. At 4.2, I have expanded on the additional impact of the care at home job evaluation and the associated cost pressures that result from that, the ongoing pressures in children's social work budget and the care home providers' market stability nationally and individually. And that individually is, is locally, obviously, as well. At 4.4, we have listed the wider risks that impact on the services. Many of these are wider organisational risks that involve the various other resources within the Council as well. And uh, item five, I have noted the work ongoing to review the Council's top risks overall. And the detail of that will be reported through the Risk and Audit Standing Committee on the 31st of October 23 and the report to the Social Work Resources Committee thereafter on the 6th of December. And I would then uh, propose to take members back to paragraph two and ask that the contents of the report be noted and the top risks approved. Thank you, Craig. Um, I've got Councillor Frame. Hi, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Craig, for the report. My question is on your, the Appendix 2. So your workforce availability and capacity, so it's sitting at very high. You've got it there, and I think that's quite disturbing, to be honest with you, considering we're not even in the winter yet. And it's sitting here, and it's the lack of capacity and skills to meet increased service demands, and then it goes on. So what are we doing to ensure that we can do that? Any improvements on that? Thank you. Yeah, so this relates to some of the information that Ian previously gave. Uh, there's a range of things we're doing to try and support getting the right staff in the right place to be able to do that. But again, that's set against a national context where we are competing with a lot of other providers. There's a recognised national shortage in this workforce area and therefore all that we can do, we're doing to try and make sure we're maximising the, the staff we've got. And some of that will be about how we review services across the year. And in previous winters, what we have done is we have uh, entered into a recognised uh, scenario where we prioritise services to those who are most vulnerable. So that's one of the things we will think about as part of our winter planning again, so that we're able to prioritise services accordingly. Thanks for that. I just think, I, know, I understand what you're saying and I understand what Ian's saying, but this is a resource that's not so any much improvement for COVID. It's got worse. Probably this is one of the resources that's maybe getting worse since COVID because nobody's wanting to take these jobs. But we've got an ageing population who have people who require care and we are now going to be struggling to provide that care for. So I don't. I just don't see how we're going to improve it and how we're going to get these staff in and what we're doing to make our, make the resource more fashionable to our youngsters or anybody that's maybe leaving college or leaving school to maybe want to come in to be carers. I've been a carer for 23 years, and to be a carer is um, a vocation. You don't go into that because it's a vocation, but we need to find out how we're going to get more of the people who are looking for more of a vocation rather than just saying, oh, we're needing... Because if you're going to get people in, they're not going to stay. Thank you. Last Suman to respond to that. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Frame. Your points are entirely well made. We've discussed that individually and we've discussed it here at committee before. So I would remind all members, when we talk about there being a social care workforce crisis across the country, that this is how it's manifested. So you will recall briefings we provided in terms of the most recent Audit Scotland report about local government and ID around social care, which makes exactly those points you've highlighted in terms of the national picture. The actions that we are taking forward certainly from a resource and management perspective are absolutely in line with what practice is elsewhere. There are a range of policy challenges for local authorities and other public bodies in this space. 
I would also say that there's a real need to do the work you've articulated there, and indeed members will have heard me talk about in the past, about actually how we talk about the importance of social care and social work as a vocation across all levels. At a local level, members again recall the work we've been doing in terms of establishing a care pan Lancashire Care Academy. We will be looking to bring forward a report into the autumn, providing an update in terms of the, where we've progressed within the first year of that. Certainly having had a discussion earlier on this week with NES, which have got uh, a dedicated unit now set up in support of social care. Uh, they're very interested in what we're doing here and what we can share in terms of learning around the national processes, as well as what we intend to do locally in terms of a pipeline. Uh, and particularly that would include the work we're doing with our educational establishments and personnel colleagues can talk to that in more detail. And again, we will have sent that set out a bigger report. Uh, as members will also recall, as part of the minute, uh, we did bring a debrief of the last winter's plan and the consequences of that, that Craig spoke to the last meeting in quite a lot of depth and it stimulated a very useful discussion. That speaks to a lot of the, end, the ongoing work that Craig's highlighted, but we did make the point there. There are essentially winter in Scotland now happens 365 days a year. There are points of surge that are associated, for example, with bank holiday, or public holidays, etc. But actually, we're working in a much more volatile area, again, for all the reasons you've talked about in terms of the demographic changes we have in front of us, as well as the very fundamentally high levels of care required in our community. And going back to the previous points that were raised by Councillor Brown and others here, uh, we do have a supply challenge across the piece. That doesn't just relate to our in-house services, but also in terms of our external providers. And again, Councillor Frame, you and I have had a discussion about some of the pressures in terms of that space. The reality is, and I know members appreciate this, there are no easy, quick, straightforward or quick fixes to any of this. That's why it's a crisis. All I can say that as a resource, we continue doing everything that we can within our power and working with our partners to make sure we stabilise the system as far as we can and to recognise the efforts of our staff across all these services at a difficult time. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Alan Faulkner. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just two quick points uh, regarding the recruitment and retention. I don't know if the, the director's aware that North Lancashire were partners or were stakeholders, whatever we want to call them. They increased the social work staff by two grades because they were finding retention, recruitment retention bad. But my first point was going to be on the academy. What is the progress of the academy since we sent it up? Set it up. Thank you. Morning. Thank you for that. As I said, we will bring a full report back to the next meeting that will provide an update on all the specific actions we set out within there. Uh, we've been in the stage at this of the, over the last few months of consolidating the work across both North Lanarkshire Council, South Lanarkshire Council and indeed NHS Lanarkshire in terms of the key areas there. We have working groups set up which have got membership from all the different parties. So, as I said, we'll bring back a full report to the next meeting that will set out the actions and what our plans are for the following week, sorry, weeks, months and years thereafter. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I just wanted to make a, a point, if I may, that the whole issue of the uh, re-evaluation exercise for the care staff workers, which was supported by the administration, the back pay um, element of the thing as well, although it's costly to the council at the end of the day, is actually an essential part, isn't it, of really being able to um, stabilise the workforce, help retention and recruitment. And I wonder if I can ask Suman, if I might, just what part he thinks the, um, the whole issue of adequate pain conditions for the workforce in that regard is, particularly referring to the care staff. Thank you, Councillor Brown. So this very much reinforces the comments that Ian's made earlier on in terms of that. So certainly we would hope that from a retention perspective that would make the council more attractive employer for staff we've already got. And I'm sure there'll be staff externally or indeed another post within the council will be keen and willing to take up those posts going forward. As Ian also said, though, that all relates to one part of our workforce and what we've tended to find is and across a whole range of areas that it, we need to be thoughtful about the destabilising effects of either staff from other areas of our care or indeed other parts of the council moving into those roles which has an impact on those services or indeed the amount of provision that's able to be provided to the independent sector. In terms of the overall delivery of social care and support we provide in our communities, we require, we require that to be a stable, what we call a stable marketplace both in terms of in-house provision as well as our independent providers and one of the challenges, again, committees heard me speak about this before, we found is that oh, essentially we're swimming in the same pool. And real challenge for us within South Lanarkshire 
as in the case across Scotland as well, is how we can increase the pool of people who want to work in social care, regardless of who their employers are. Uh, as colleagues have also set out, in terms of the implications of that, we were still going through the process of calculating that, so we'll get a better understanding of what the implications for that will be going forward. I would also make the point uh, that having had the reports in terms of the revenue position, there is also a significant financial challenge that we need to navigate here as well, and that's the other part of the social care crisis across Scotland. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. I also think in relation to that, it doesn't help that the whole process in the National Care Service seems to have um, came to a standstill. Um, uh, and unfortunately, um, there were a lot of you know, negative sort of feedback in relation to the consultation around that. So there are a lot of issues of that we've known um, for the past you know, decade about the crisis in social care. And unfortunately, though, um, the attempt to look at that and be in innovative and look at a national care service has somewhat came to a, an abrupt standstill. Um, so unfortunately, that's um, not really in, improved the situation at the moment. So it's really um, left to what we are doing um, in terms of our sort of innovations, the evaluation and looking at care pathways. And we're going to be discussing later on in one of the papers how um, those issues are, are, are being tackled and how we're trying to improve all of these issues that you've, you've raised, Councillor Frame. Um, anyway, I have Mary Donnelly. Thanks. Sorry, I'll ask Suman to come back. Thanks. Sorry for interrupting, Councillor Donnelly. Uh, we just did a follow-up point, and absolutely in terms of what the Chair set out there, there is a need and I've been quite clear, as indeed a number of individuals in this chamber have been quite need clear about the need for national solutions and a national framework in terms of pain conditions. And regardless of what the eventual outcomes of around the national care service has been proposed, certainly I continue to be a keen advocate for that. The other point I would say is that we need to look around our social care and social work care workforce as a whole and so that's very much why we've got a subsequent item, the next item on this agenda is really critical to us in terms of the locality-based social work services modernisation programme that I'll be commending to members when Liam speak, and Ian speak to that later. Thank you. Thanks, I don't see any. Councillor Donnelly, are you still wanting to come back? You need to press a request to speak, Mary. Sorry, I'm worse at that than you, so you know, <laughs> you're no point in you depending on me. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think you made the point, the care pathways and uh, the point that Elise was making. Um, in, in terms of our recruitment, and how we're going to attract people into the job of care uh, is very, very important. So I would like to ask, what does that look like in terms of the recruitment, uh, the publicity um, and all the rest of that in order to, what are we putting out there in order to make it a, a really attractive job for people going forward? Thank you. Eileen, can you respond? Yeah, um, certainly um, we're certainly making an increased use of social media and that's about um, using that medium then to highlight all of the benefits in terms of working at South Lanarkshire and South Lanarkshire as an employer and weaving into that obviously um, the career pathway that is available um, through uh, many of our roles across um, health and social care. Um, in addition to that, um, we're also uh, using uh, things like jobs fairs and tapping in uh, through employability routes. So uh, we're de definitely doing a lot more than, than, than we have been doing. And then uh, in, in the coming months, uh, there will be a revised career website for South Lanarkshire Council. Um, and that will be another opportunity for us to promote all the opportunities that are available. Thanks. Thanks for that, Eileen. And I don't see any further questions. I'm just going to thank Craig for the report. And does the meeting agree to the recommendations in section two? Agreed. Thank you. Um, moving on to items for decision. Um, item nine is the locality based social work services modernisation programme, pages 57 to 84. And could I invite Liam to speak to the report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
Thanks very much, Chair. Morning, Committee. The purpose of this report is to advise uh, the Committee of an update in the model of delivery for services with a reconfiguration of frontline posts. That's looking at increased senior practitioner posts, development of additional operation manager posts and pool work manager posts across localities. It's also to update the Committee in relation to the recruitment and retention challenges within localities, primarily with qualified social worker posts. Section 3 of the report gives a background to the current operating model within the four localities for both children, adults and justice services. At 3.5 and 3.6, you will see that we identify the current challenges that we've been facing for a number of years in relation to recruitment and retention of frontline social work staff. 3.6 also highlights a snap uh, shot of the challenges within localities, where in May we had a 25% vacancy rate in qualified social workers, and some of those teams has transferred to actually 50% of staffing that we were down. This is a significant risk to the service, and it's already been highlighted in the previous risk report, and you will see that we have been running with this risk and the associated pressures on staff, national standards, and fulfilling public protection arrangements for some time. In section four of the report, it highlights the current challenges and references made to the set in the bar report at 4.1, and that puts it into more context. Just to add as well for the committee to know that actually South Lanarkshire Council of Social Workers were the highest returnees uh, with regards to that questionnaire for setting the path for that national return. So it shows it the strength of feeling that the social workers in South Lanarkshire felt about the, uh, the, the practice, the standards and the caseload allocation. 4.2 also highlights the challenges we face with no neighbouring authorities having regraded their own frontline staff and frontline managers. And the risk we face in relation to retention and recruitment for South Lancashire, we don't take any action. The section six details the proposal that we describe as a three horizons model of change. Horizon one is highlighted at 6.1 within the report, and it looks at the creation of operation manager posts that are currently established within the council's job evaluation scheme. This also highlights the remodeling and removal of team leader posts within localities to establish the operation manager posts. 6.2 also highlights the role of the operation managers, or they will assume the chairing and oversight of public protection responsibilities, which is a higher responsibility than current team leaders <coughs> hold. This will create more capacity to meet the demands that we currently face in public protection, and we are looking to roll, this, roll out this new model in localities over the next 12 months. Horizons 2 and 3 are also highlighted in section 6 of the report. And that looks at early intervention and redesign, but also moving to a more integrated model. And we see that as horizon two and three as we move on. Section seven of the report details the rollout of the senior practitioner role to encourage more experienced staff to come to South Lanarkshire. That would encourage recruitment, but it's also a better career pathway for existing staff, and that should hopefully support retention. We have costed that senior practitioners will be ring-fenced within each locality setting, and we're looking to, and or for those settings that do public protection responsibilities, and we're looking to ring fence a third of all frontline qualified social worker posts as senior practitioners. This isn't currently the arrangement, so this is a benefit to the service. The employee implications are highlighted in Section 8 of the report and the respective posts with the creation of the ops manager posts, the removal of team leader posts, and we've got further creation of planning officer and service manager for commissioning and quality assurance, and there's an explanation of the funding for each of those posts at Section 8. In relation to Section 9, look at the financial implications, and you'll see that this has all been costed with no additional financial resource required. Children and family services, however, it should be noted that in order to meet the financial envelope of the senior practitioners, the 3.5 QSW posts will be removed from establishment, and this will offset the higher grade. And the challenge there is, or what we're hoping to establish, is that we'd be better with 100% of higher skilled, higher motivated staff than actually 50% of posts that we can't fill. In relation to consultation and engagement, you'll see at Appendix 2 within the report that there were uh, events that took place in March with frontline staff. And staff also reiterated the pressures on frontline staff and, and the current operating model deficits. I would refer members back to the recommendations at section two of the report, namely to note the contents of the report and two, to approve the resource proposals to progress the operational structure across social work services, but also to approve the establishment of the post as highlighted at section seven. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Liam. Um, I have Councillor Buchanan. 
Thanks, Chair. Can I ask if we can have assurances that trade unions and staff will be fully consulted on the remit and the job descriptions for the new operations managers and that the changes will help to alleviate pressures on the front line and reduce caseloads as part of a package of measures? Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Just to give assurance that the, we, we have been consulting with staff, and you'll see that at Appendix 1, there's been a significant number of staff and managers consulted across the service. And trade unions were also invited to those engagement events as well. And there's been ongoing discussion with the trade unions for a number of years, I might add, because this has been a risk. The operation manager posts are currently established job and they are job evaluated within the council. They are established posts. So there doesn't need to be a consultation about what the role and remit is, because that already is established. But what we will do is what we will have to do is support localities and how we implement that because they're not established posts within localities. So we will consult with staff, primarily the managers, but also with the trade unions and with HR and how we roll that out in a planned way over the next period. Okay, thanks, Liam. I think there had been um, some concerns around that in terms of how it would impact um, the job descriptions when it did take a more locality focus. So I think there's some anxiety um, out there about the post becoming a wee bit more distant, but if you give me assurance that, that they will be uh, consulted in relation to those posts and, 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 and how they evolve um, in relation to this new model. Um, okay, thank you. I've got Alan Faulkner. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Just a couple of questions. The, we've been ongoing about recruitment and retention of social workers, and I see in 7.1 that a third of your current social workers are going to move on to senior practitioners. Is that taking them away from the front line? Also, in your structure there, I mean, a social worker would normally be allocated a case by a senior who would supervise them, and who would be supervised by a team leader. We've now then put another two layers in, an operations manager and then a field manager. And the problem's at the front line because we can't recruit social workers to do the caseloads. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Faulkner. Uh, the senior practitioners will not be removed from frontline duties. They'll actually be more, they'll be our ex expert and working to the top of their grade and uh, the top of their licence, so to speak, as senior practitioners. And there, they, that's where we've got the current issue where we, we can recruit and we have been recruiting a number of uh, newly qualified staff, but they can stay with us for two or three years and they're then ready to do the more senior intense work and they move on to other disciplines or other types of work. So this hopefully will be a, a motivation for people to remain because we will remunerate them with a higher pay scale within that. In relation to the, the allocation, the, uh, uh, the chart may be confusing, but what it does is it streamlines it because we have grade threes will report to a grade four, and that's the ops manager, that's the new grade. And grade fours will report to grade five, which is the field work managers, and they are existing grades within localities, so there would be no change <coughs> to that. And operations managers will assume the allocation of work to senior practitioners and to qualified social workers and paraprofessionals. That's already established, so that shouldn't be a change and doesn't create another layer of administration within that. What we will do, and we've all seen in relation to the senior practitioners, senior practitioners will be able to in theory, it, well, in practice, they can actually afford to do everything that a team leader does with the exception of supervising staff. So they can still do allocations and what they will do is we will expect them to do is to be mentoring new staff and coaching new staff, which gives additional support to new qualified workers coming in. So we see this redesign as something that hopefully gives us more strength to recruitment and retention going forward. Thanks, Liam. Um, and could I also um, welcome the report as being part of a package of measures um, that's going to help um, enhance the posts and allow um, social workers to, to focus more on the things that, that, that they should be. I mean, over the, um, the past few years, there's been a third, 30 odd percent of business support staff have been cut across Scotland. So that's the environment that, that local authorities and social workers have been, have been working under um, and all staff um, in, in social care um, in conjunction with um, the cuts that local authorities have had 
to make to what they you know termed as being support staff. But unfortunately, when you do that sooner or later, that's got an impact in the front line. Um, it's got an, it's an, got an impact on the level of service that, that we're able to provide, and your caseloads going up. Uh, and I think this this paper uh, in terms of creating a better care pathway for people, um, but also more crucially, hopefully in conjunction with other measures that have been put in, like additional social work, um, social work assistance for care at home, will be designed. And Matthew asked the question to actually impact on some of the findings that came out from the set in the bar report. One of the key ones being the caseloads have just got to unacceptable levels. Um, and the fact that because all of that support has been cut because of the funding crisis in local authorities that they've been dealing with over the last decade, um, they were no longer able, you know, to use their, their skills um, and to be able to, you know, focus on a certain number of cases. So, um, and Liam will correct me if I'm wrong, but this paper and all of the other measures um, that we have um, implemented over the past two years are an attempt um, to rectify that situation and to improve the quality um, of those posts and to and give people other opportunities to get higher graded posts and crucially um, to improve the care that we're given. For example, in the area of delayed discharge, um, if we're able to have more staff to get through assessments and get people out of hospital. Um, so I think un under the, the challenging circumstances that the local authorities have had to work under the challenging financial circumstances, um, I think th this um, at least will start to make an impact um, on those different areas and all of the issues in terms of the demographic changes that were highlighted um, through the, the set in the bar report. Um, and, and, and obviously we, we can ask for you know, kind of evaluation and reports in terms of how these service remodeling um, it is impacting on the, on the, the care that we provide. The, there is, it's not only, there is the issue um, of pay and the evaluation and all of that hopefully will be positive as well. But in order to actually change um, the issues that we're highlighting in terms of caseload and lack of admin and lack of support, you also have to look at how you're providing the service and how you remodel the service to tackle that. I mean, the comparison I always think in, Yes, I'm in favour of nurses and doctors getting more money, but that in itself won't mean that I will get um, an operation any quicker um, or if somebody needs a hip operation. That aspect in itself won't resolve that. It's got to go hand in hand with remodelling the service and that's um, what um, this committee and, and social work with all of the various reports and measures that have went through that's the result that, that we're trying to achieve, as I say, under very difficult financial circumstances. Uh, and there'll be some tough decisions ahead as well. So I'd just like to thank Liam for the report. And, and if there are no other questions, I'll move on to item 10. It's, sorry, <laughs> does, does the meeting agree to recommendation two in the report? Agreed. Agreed, thank you. Um, moving on to item 10, reducing drug deaths, the South Lanarkshire Alcohol and Drug Problem Solving Court, and it's pages 85 to 114, and could I ask Gillian Booth to speak to the report? Thank you. And good morning, committee. So I would like to present um, the paper in front of you today on our South Lanarkshire Alcohol and Drug Problem Solving Court. Um, the purpose of the report is to update the committee on an innovative two-year test of change problem solving court. Uh, to note the findings of the independent evaluation uh, for the justice support worker pilot uh, that we uh, implemented in uh, 2021. Um, and also to seek approval for the posts as detailed in Section 7 to be added to the establishment on a temporary basis. So I'd like to firstly say that this initiative has the potential to change the direction of national standards for community payback orders in Scotland. We have worked over the last year in partnership with Hamilton Sheriff Court and Sheriff Principal to look at developing a, a two-year test of change. Um, you will see in section three that I've um, made reference to the um, CORA Foundation application to the improvement fund that we made um, last November. 
Um, and also, in addition, we put an application into the Alcohol and Drug uh, Partnership um, in South Lanarkshire for additional funding. So I'm pleased to say that we were successful in our CORA um, funding bid um, and also in relation to the um, Alcohol uh, and Drug Partnership bid as well. So I've placed um, also some information about the, the principles around this um, initiative and in that we're very much looking to take a public health approach to addictions um, and supporting people um, at the earliest stages possible in the justice system with the um, projection um, and intention of preventing people going further into the justice system and trying to remove them from it. And we're looking to do this um, through also our um, alcohol and drug partnership um, public health uh, approach group, which I chair, um, and also taking, taking into account the Changing Lives uh, 2022 report that sets out a number of uh, priority areas and actions. So you'll see in section four that I've detailed some of the analytics that we have from our alcohol and drug partnership. Um, and you'll note the, the, the concerning numbers of drug related deaths in South Lanarkshire. Um, and also, um, the, some of the data that we've got around the, the age range, um, particularly of males that have died. Um, in our area um, and also what we know about those that have been in treatment um, as well as uh, those who have had uh, near fatal overdoses. So that has helped um, shape the design of this service and you will see in terms of section five the operation of the court. So we're very much taking um, a structured deferred sentence approach whereby we will look at um, identifying people uh, at the uh, social work court report stage that would be eligible for this uh, service. Um, now, what makes this court different from some other problem solving courts is we're very much focused on being able to identify those that have uh, are at risk of custody, as well as those that have been on previous diversion from prosecution and community payback orders, which have to people that have traditionally not managed to sustain the level of uh, intensity and structure around a community payback order. So we know that for people that have um, a lot of uh, needs, um, particular issues related with substance use, that the stringent measures around the breach process um, do not necessarily work. So a structured deferred sentence approach is very much about supporting people at the earliest opportunity. It's about um, providing additional support through peer mentors um, and also working with families. So I've also uh, attached in Appendix 1 the um, iconic um, consultancy independent evaluation of our peer mentor service um, that we introduced in 2021. Um, and we note that some of the findings from that have been extremely positive, particularly around the use of people with lived experience that complement and support our workforce. Um, and we're also um, aware that in terms of that, as we would call it, stickability, with our service users and being able to link them in at the earliest possible opportunity to um, dedicated services such as our care service, um, employability, welfare, um, and also traditional universal services such as your, your GP practices. So we've taken our learning and findings from there um, and embedded that into this approach as well. I'll just move on also to say around about our MAT standards, medically assisted treatment, um, that this um, works hand in glove with those principles, particularly in terms of MAT standard three um, in relation to assertive outreach and trying to get people um, into uh, where necessary um, treatment um, at the earliest opportunity. So, I've outlined in section six the smart objectives around the, 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 the high level objectives around reducing drug use and also reducing drug related deaths. And also, as I've outlined earlier, in terms of working um, in partnership with other services um, and taking very much an individual and, and, and treatment focused approach. Um, section 7 outlines our financial implications. You will note that we're looking to uh, um, to recruit staff uh, part-time as 
team leader, um, social work staff and peer mentor staff into the service. We're looking to do that obviously on a two-year basis, um, given that that's the funding runs for the two years, um, but we're seeking to make those permanent to the establishment, social work establishment thereafter. Um, I've outlined the financial commitment that we've received. You, you will see that we obviously received a um, 100,000 for uh, each year of the two years from CORA and also the uh, 45, um, sorry, the 89,000 uh, for the first year from the ADP and 45,000 for the second year. So I would just um, go back and um, ask the committee um, to um, agree the recommendations that are noted in the report, also the independent evaluation of the Justice Support Worker Pilot from Iconic Consultancy and um, also the posts uh, being um, included into the establishment for two years. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for that, Gillian. I've got a few questions here. Um, Councillor Dempsey. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Gillian. I just want to uh, thank you for that report. It's really informative uh, and enlightening the work being done here uh, in South Lancashire to tackle the root cause of crime by people with drug and alcohol dependence as a health issue rather than, you know, just with incarcerations or financial penalties that people often can't afford. Uh, obviously, uh, this is against a national backdrop where many of us would like to see drug policy controlled at Holyrood. So we can introduce measures like safe consumption rooms, but um, I'm really glad to see uh, such a of work being done here. I'm also really glad to see uh, Scottish money, uh, Scottish government money coming uh, towards this initiative, uh, whether it's here at local government level or uh, Scottish government level with initiatives like uh, minimum, minimum unit pricing, which obviously this week was shown to reduce alcohol deaths by 13%. Um, it's great to see us using the devolved justice and health competencies that we have uh, right now to make a difference in people's lives. Um, so on behalf of myself and my group, I just want to thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks, Councillor Damesey. I've got Councillor Brown. The report, I mean, in a way, it's one of these things, the stickability, the public health um, approach and all that, you wonder that it hadn't been actually identified and sort of action, actioned on some time ago. I remember when I was in Parliament dealing with, I think it was the 2010 legislation that did a lot of the stuff in the background of the community payback orders and stuff. And um, at that time, I must say, I, I always thought that the emphasis on the the criminal justice element of the thing, as opposed to the rehabilitation element, was not quite the right balance. And I think what's um, we're emerging out of this is the um, really the, the run through of experience of ten years or thereabouts of that uh, system and the deficiencies that go with it. At the end of the day, though, the the ultimate test of this is whether it stops people reoffending and allows them to restore, if you like, an element of normality. And I just wonder if there's an element of um, monitoring of this because um, in, in a way reoffending figures are quite stark on this matter. An awful lot of the, the, the people and, and we're identifying young people in particular aren't with 90% of people with this in the, in the background. Um, the, 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 the question of how people restore their lives is really very important there. Have we got, if you like, ability to monitor this properly to compare it with what was happening under similar people, if you like, in other regimes before this and really, therefore, to say, well, there's been a 50% improvement or whatever at, at the end of the, of, of the period of this thing. Because I think you can measure reoffending rates quite successfully. That's easy to do. It's a, it's a good proxy measure. Measuring whether people have come off drugs or come off alcohol is a bit more difficult because, obviously, it's self-reporting to some degree there. You're not, you're not entirely getting the whole picture there. Have we got an actual ability to do this in an effective way that will... Um, I think go with the grain of what we think should be the position, but to actually prove it uh, once we've had this in operation for a little while. Thank you, Councillor. Um, thank you for those points. Um, yes, it's something we're acutely aware of about being able to gather um, accurate data in terms of reoffending rates. Uh, one of the things we've looked at previously um, with Community Justice Scotland and the Court Services is, and the Procurator Fiscal Service is actually how we gather data. We often don't know if somebody has come back into the justice system, justice social work that is, until we actually get asked for a further report. So 
really um, the, the data to, for us is limited to what's on actually our systems. Um, but something that Community Justice Scotland is keen to work with authorities and the judiciary on is how we better collate data. So it's something that we will be taking forward. Um, I should also say that one of the uh, conditions for um, us receiving the national drug mission uh, monies from CODA was that we would seek independent evaluation that not just um, assessed really what the service users experience was but also systematic change so we're keen to look at uh, working with an appropriate uh, provider whether that's university um, or uh, a separate uh, consultancy agency to look about how we define the measures and how we collate that data so I would be you know I'd be happy to be able to to, to give the committee an update if 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 seek, seeking that at a later stage. Um, David Watson. Thanks, Chair. I maybe just ask the question, I mean, getting that there's a public health justice crossover here, where does this sit with core council funding as a, and as a council service? And I acknowledge just now we're getting external funding towards this, but obviously going forward, the budgets are getting more challenging. And uh, we're having to look at, we're, we're going to have to look at what's core and what's non-core. Non and, and, and just to see where this sits within that. And also just ask the question about capacity. Is the capacity round about the figure that's quoted, the, the number of the users on page 97 of the report? So that would be the sort of capacity on, on an annual basis. Yeah, okay. And I say, if you could maybe just answer the thing about core funding and, and what happens once uh, the, the external funding dries up. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor, for those questions. Um, yes, uh, I appreciate that two years is not a very long time. Um, we've got a lot to do, a lot to try and achieve. Um, one of the things I am hopeful for is that, um, obviously, within our Section 27 budget, um, the, the Scottish Government are looking to incentivise a uh, structured deferred sentence scheme options that local authorities implement. So I would be looking after the first year to be having a conversation with the Scottish Government based on our figures and numbers that we've got going through the court in terms of what commitment could be made to additional funding to our Section 27 grant. I appreciate that as a high ask at this stage, but I think if we can demonstrate that we're pulling people from community payback orders to um, structured deferred sentence, and we obviously are traditionally you know, given money for community payback orders, I think there's a really strong argument for that funding to be deferred to structured deferred sentence. So as I say, there is a mechanism just now for incentivisation for structured deferred sentence, and I would like to, to develop those discussions with the Scottish Government. So did that answer your questions? Thanks, unless I'm not understanding it properly, okay. and I apologise for that. The... Obviously, social work do core and non-core. Is this core or non-core? I think it's just a, a yes or no. But I think what you're saying is through, if it was classed within the section 27, it might be. Uh -huh. am, am I right in taking it that way? Yeah. Well, yes, because as in the, the way that our service is viewing this is that th this would be the same work that we would do for somebody that was placed on a community payback order. The approach is different. So technically this is coming under core funding. Yeah. And, and you'll see from obviously the finances that a, a large part of this initiative is being paid for through our Section 27 budget. So the shortfall is being made up through that. Can I bring Suman in here? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Watson, just to build on Julian's point. So just for clarification, the, uh, the vast majority of the funding for our social justice services is through the Section 27 grant. So although it, it is core activities, as Julian said, we're looking to reorientate with an existing activity, but the, the vast majority of that core work is funded through that Section 27 grant. So in that regard, it's different from other areas, for example, of children's social expenditure, which is related to the Council's allocation to that budget. Happy with that, Councillor Watson? OK, 
Okay, I don't see any further questions. I could also just um, echo the, the comments um, regarding the report. I think it's a very um, positive report um, and, uh, and according to the, the evaluation of the, the test pilot has been very positively uh, received in terms of its impact um, and I think it, it, it's very welcome and we look forward to, to hearing about its progress. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Does the meeting agree to the recommendations in the report and also to the evaluation and to the integration of the posts? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, moving on to items for noting. Implementing medication assistant treatment standards in South Lanarkshire. Update pages 115 to 120. And could I invite Ian to speak to the report? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. So, so this report will be links um, to, to the, the, the report that Gillian just presented. So it's about medication assisted um, treatment. So this is a, a programme that's really focused on folks who are at greater risk of harm from, from, from drug use. Uh, we're trying to, to reduce um, drug-related drug deaths. So there's, there's different elements to this. There's 10 standards to be implemented. There's a kind of local element around our local treatment services, and there's elements of this which are linked to more kind of NHS Lanarkshire services, which are hosted by our, by our colleagues in, in the north. And we've got a kind of working group across north and south partnerships just looking at those kind of, kind of, kind of crossover issues. So the report's really giving you an update on where we've got to in implementing the, the standards. You'll see in the table in section 4.3 that... Um, we're making progress across most of the standards, but there's still work to be done. Um, a lot of this is to do with them um, actually getting staff in post and getting the services commenced. So we want to make sure the model was correct in, in the first instance. So there's been a test of change done in the Clydesdale area that proved to be successful. And we're building the learning from that. So we've now recruited into the local treatment team, three advanced nurse practitioners, some peer support workers, some coordination capacity. So those staff are now, are now um, in post, coming into post. So the service is now, now starting to operate. Um, so standards are one to five. We're making the most progress on. Those are the ones we've kind of focused in particular. As Gillian's there, identifying there, that kind of assertive outreach, identifying people most at risk, connecting services together. This is some of, some of the key work that's, that's ongoing. Um, there's work also around um, um, standards, kind of um, six through ten, looking at um, the, the input of um, psychological therapies, trauma-informed practice, and so forth. And you'll note that probably the, the, the trickiest area is standard seven, which relates to kind of the interface with primary care. That's um, specifically because the, the model of um, the delivery in, in Lanarkshire is different from other, other health boards and our medical directors can having a look at how we um, bring together what we're doing um, to align with the standards as best we can and given, given that, that that kind of, kind of situation um, prevails. So we're really asking the, the committee to, to note that there's progress being made in terms of implementing the standards and uh, uh, we'll, we'll bring back a, a future update uh, and hopefully some of the, the ambers will be in green at that stage as the services get fully up to speed. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Councillor Donnelly. Um, thank you, Chair. In regards to item 11, uh, I'd just like to thank Ian and his team uh, for the report that they've just presented, as it's a very informative report, and I know this is a second report, uh, and good to see the great work being done here. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Donnelly. I don't see any more questions, so can I just thank Ian for the report and welcome the report. Um, I think it will make a difference um, in conjunction with the, the, um, the structured intervention in the previous paper. We will hopefully make an impact in what has been not a great situation um, in Scotland, um, and it, it's good to see that we're now getting some long overdue funding and some of the innovative service uh, models that are, are being put in place and we look forward to further reports on them. Um, so thank you, Ian. Um, does the committee agree to the recommendations in the report? Agreed, thank you. Um, moving on to item 12, notification of contracts awarded October 2022 to March 2023 and that's pages 121 to 124 and could I invite Suman to speak to the report. Thank you. Thank you, members. Sorry, IT problems there. Uh, members will be familiar with this. It's a routine report that we bring here in terms of uh, 
uh, standing orders and contracts for the period 1st of October 22 to 31st of March 2023. Um, the background is, as you've seen it before, in terms of a requirement of clauses 21.8 and 22.5 of the standing orders, in terms of details of acceptance of all tenders above 50,000 to be reported retrospectively to the relevant committee, in that case here. Uh, contracts awarded for the period under 4.1 are set out within the appendix, uh, and I would refer committee back to the recommendations under section 2 for the details of the contracts awarded to be noted. Thank you. Thank you, Suman. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thanks, Chair. Just on uh, page 123, the Rutherglen Community Carers, and really I'm, I'm asking what services that providing uh, and what the criteria is for that. Uh, and I'll, there's a similar group in East Bride that have always struggled to get funding from the council, a well-established uh, dementia carers group. Uh, so just seeking some clarity and, and why one and not the other. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can pick that up. So we, we've... Um, Committee might, might recall we've established a, a kind of team um, to have a look at um, contracts um, and commissioning arrangements. So that team's been undertaking a, a programme of work in Rutherglen Community Carers, who's one of one of the um, contracted providers we, we had a look at. So we were operating with um, probably a, a, an out of date kind of um, model of, of inter interaction with, with the service. So we, we sought to kind of modernise it. So the, the provide a range of services, uh, dementia support, and uh, um, some registered kind of care at home type, type, type services. So we brought them in line with existing um, arrangements, essentially, um, and we'll be you know, carrying on that kind of program of work around around the range of different providers just to make sure we're um, meeting our kind of commissioning intentions and that the contracts that we've got in play are up to date and uh, are delivering what we require from the providers. Sorry, I'll maybe just take it up out with the meeting, but I, I just I'm not sure that's the answer I was looking for. But anyway, we'll, we'll maybe take it up separately. Thanks. You happy that Ian? Take it yeah, I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, it may be well that the, the East Kilbride service might be more straightforward just to look at it out with the meeting, and we can have a look at where that fits within the program. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Councillor Donnelly. Just the, the care and repair in South Lanarkshire, um, assistive te technology installation. Um, can you tell me, is that to do with the fire alarms being installed and then other assistive technology being installed by them? Yeah, so I can pick that up. So that's primarily around things like... Um, um, key safes um, and some of some of the kind of the, the telecare equipment that um, care and repair have always been involved in uh, um, supporting us to deliver. So that's just, a, just a, you know, an update to the contractual arrangements around that work. Right. Thank you um, and thanks for that report, Sue. I don't see any more questions. Um, does the meeting agree to the recommendations in the report? Thank you. Um, item 13, I don't have any items of urgent business, so could I just close the meeting and thank um, all of you for your attendance and contributions and all of the officers who have provided, as usual, excellent reports, um, informative, um, and just to wish you all um, a very good summer holiday and see you all in August, and I hope we've got better weather than we've got today. <laughs> thank you.